Uh, you're all very welcome to uh, this, our seventh talk in our uh, Custom House, Burning of the Custom House 1921 conference and Cade Mila Fawlty, the Eva Fad. Um, first, we'd just like to, a quick word of thanks to our Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage, Tara O'Brien, uh, to Tim Carey, Sean Hogan, Jerry Shannon, all in the Custom House for their support and uh, help, not just this year, but down the years. Now, our talk tonight is presented by Cathy Scuffle. For us Dubliners and for anyone of you know, who knows her, she is one of our own. She's got an unrivaled passion for the city, its history and its place in history. Cathy is Dublin born and reared. Her interest in local history was formed at an early age and encouraged by her parents who shared their love of Dublin with her. Cathy has been deeply and enthusiastically involved in her local area and in 1986 she was honorary secretary for the and founder member of the Dolphins Barn Historical Society. She compiled and edited their first publication by the sign of the Dolphin in 1993. As she has worked hard to hone and expand her skills over the years, in addition to an honours business and management degree, she holds both a certificate and a master's in local history from the National University of Ireland in Maynooth. A master's thesis, uh, the research for that was published by the Four Courts Press as the South Circular Road Dublin on the eve of the First World War. And her accompanying talk uh, was awarded the silver medal by the Old Dublin Society in 2018. Now, I first met Cathy when she was so actively involved in a wide range of community events during the 1916 Rising Centenary commemorations, researching the Rialto Kilmainham 1916 commemoration photographic exhibition and the publication 1916 in the South Dublin Union for St. James's Hospital. And I was almost overwhelmed by her enthusiasm and genuine desire to help everyone who asked for it. So it is such a pleasure to see that she is currently working as historian in residence with Dublin City Council uh, for the South Central area. For almost every day or so, the South Circular Road, um, the, uh, in addition, she has in her spare time, she's a consultant historian for other projects. Now, Cathy's talk for us uh, now is about an event that occurred after the burning of the Custom House and just before the truce. The period when, according to some, the IRA was decimated by the loss of so many men in the Custom House attack. But as Cathy will show, after the burning, uh, the Dublin Brigade IRA continued its attacks against the Crown forces undaunted. Shifting the focus now to attacking military supplies and infrastructure, the IRA pr proved it was capable of carrying on the conflict and continuing to bring the fight to the enemy. The last major engagement undertaken by the Dublin Brigade uh, was on 8th of July 1921 when a train carrying troops, military supplies, horses and civilians was ambushed as it passed under the railway bridge near what was then a uh, rural hamlet of Ballyfermot. It was carried out by members of the 4th Battalion ASU, some of whom uh, ha had been involved in the Custom House attack. It occurred just hours before the formal announcement that the truce had been called, marked the end of the War of Independence. So hand over to you now, Cathy, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Great, thank you very much, Michal, uh, and a huge thank you to yourself and to Liz for making all the arrangements for tonight, and indeed in the build-up to this. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, uh, and an honour, a real honour to be here and to be part of the commemoration of the burning of the Custom House and bring my little bit of the story to it as well. So if you bear with me for one moment, I'll just share my screen and I'll have the presentation starting in just a couple of moments. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up? That's, I'm sure that's come across okay. Uh, thank you all very much. So, continuing the, the fight unhindered, the Ballyfermot train ambush. And like everything else, you have to give a bit of a context, give it its background, and work out uh, how the story came about as such. Um, as you're, you, you have to really set the scene and understand where we're talking about. So if we just take the area of Ballyfermot for a moment, this is what it looks like today. Thanks to Google Maps and all, all the new technology we have, Ballyfermot is a busy suburb 
quite near the city centre really, but a very, very busy suburb of Dublin, located to the west, very self-sufficient area, um, multi-generational families in the area now, and very much a suburban setting. It's only been that suburban setting in the last 70 years or so, when the Ballyfermot as we know it today has actually developed. Um, there are key locations even within this aerial photograph that are elements of the past. So in a sense, we can nearly pick out field patterns when we look at this particular aerial photograph. But most importantly of all, we can pick out the main route of the canal and the railway running through um, our image here in, in the aerial photograph that we have of Ballyfermot. So to take us back, this is what it would have looked like way back a um, hundred years ago. The area of Ballyfermot was very, very rural, but there were hamlets, there were groups of people, cottages, farms dotted around the area. The key employers, and this is very much reflected by um, the, the, when you look at the census records, even for the time, and, and you can see what's dominating the area. The railway works here at Inchicore. I'm just moving the cursor across the screen now. There's the railway works at Inchicore. Again, we have our uh, railway line and canal dominating the images here in the, um, the, the aerial, the map shot that we, we have up. But you can see very much that it's a rural hamlet. Uh, it, all the areas, every square there is a field. And there's something going on just at this particular point. And I'm using this as a location so that people can really understand the setting that we're talking about as we work our way through the talk. So you can see here Ballyfermot Castle. There's a church mark. There's, a, there's actually a trig mark on the map as well. So that indicates a mound of some description. And there's a number of houses in this area too. This was the site of Ballyfermot Castle, the graveyard and the church. It, this is what it would have looked like. And uh, uh, as time went on, the church was very, very much in ruin. Now, to tell you exactly where that is, most people of the Ballyfermot area can point it out by telling you it's in the lawns park. So that very, very large park that we have at that part of Ballyfermot, that is actually exactly where Ballyfermot Castle and Church were located. Just up from it, we have a railway line. And this is the main railway line heading down towards the Curra, Clondalk and next stop book, coming out of Inchicore, coming out of Houston Station. This is the line that came across there, still there today. But this is what it would have looked like back 100 years ago absolutely rural setting, the undulating embankment, the remnants of digging out the original railway line through the area itself, and the bridge standing in perfect isolation in the, in the area. Some people would call it Killeen. It's that part of Ballyfermot. Our castle and church would be just off screen, off to the right. So you can see what the area would have looked like. This was pure countryside the minute you left the city. While I have that picture up, I just want to particularly mention the Ballyfermot Heritage Group, who have been unbelievably helpful in, in making images available. Because when you're trying to put a talk together, you really are reliant on local history and heritage groups. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with them over the years. So on this, I just mentioned Ken Larkin for his help in putting this talk together. Further up from this bridge is another one, and this is the bridge that goes over the canal. So it's known as the South Hawk Bridge, we would have had a pub there. So we have a pub, we have a railway line, and we have fields, we have small little hamlets, small cottages, a rural setting, very much so, and only changed with the coming of the Ballyfermot suburb that we have been, uh, has been developing in the last 70 plus years or thereabouts. I did a quick check on the 1911 census just to get a sense of what were people working at in the area. There, there was a population there, all set in a rural landscape, all living in cottages, some attached to farms, things like that. And primarily, they returned themselves as farmers, labourers or dairymen. But we have a group of people living in this community too, 
and mill workers that heading out to Killeen would have gone over the bridges at Ballyferm with the railway line and the one further up on the canal, bringing up to the big mills up at Killeen near Clondalkin and also the other mills that were located in around Bluebell area of Dublin, the, the Camac uh, mills were located there too. And a lot of people had worked with the waterworks because the canal unusually was siphoned off at different stretches along the canal and uh, the water supplies that were providing them for industrial purposes inside the city. So the revelation of that water uh, provided a significant amount of employment too and you find quite a number of people in Ballyfermot having an association with the waterworks. But far beyond all this are the group that are working in those railway works at Inchicore. And behind all of this is an entire area closely associated with the 4th Battalion IRA. It's part of that whole network for the 4th Battalion and it's a key part in this particular story. Again, just an image of our rural valley farm which feels as far as you can see. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to get images like this because it's hard to set the scene. But if you have images like this, they certainly do help. So let's look at Ireland 100 years ago. What, what were we talking about? What was it like? So in the lead up to the time span we're speaking about, we're recovering from the 1916 rising. It's still a talking point. It's still very much in the local psyche. The anti-conscription campaign had ended because World War I was over. So a lot of things had come to an end. Uh, so the, the world was moving on. As soon as the war was over, a general election was called. It was eight years since we had one. In the St. James's division in the city centre, uh, Joe McGrath is elected. In the St. Patrick's Division, adjacent to St. James's, and this is the one closely associated with the liberties of Dublin, Countess Markovic has been elected. The first woman to be elected to a parliament anywhere in the first election that women had the vote. Those two areas together, the St. James Division and the St. Patrick's Division, today we'd more or less equate to the area we know as Dublin South Central today, the, the political area, the electoral area of Dublin South Central. On the 21st of January 1919, the first doll was held in the Mansion House in Dublin. And the two people that I have mentioned, Joe McGrath and the Countess Markovic, were Feigloss e Golov, or imprisoned by the foreigners. So neither of them were actually there. They were in jail. So it even gives you an idea of the people who had been elected to this doll. On the same day as the first doll is heard, the War of Independence starts. The official um, agreement, uh, you know, it's a, a date that's used to denote the beginning of the War of Independence. Some may argue it had been happening uh, before that, but let's take it as it is. We'll connect it to Solihead Beg, County Tipperary, when two RIC constables were killed in the ambush in the, near the quarries uh, there. And this marks the start of the War of Independence in Ireland. Part of this War of Independence, as we work our way through it, and one of the things that would have been a talking point in the rural hamlets around Ballyfermot, Bluebell, Inchicore, that part of Dublin, would be these sporadic incidents that had been happening. Here's one, the uh, attempted mining of the Crumman Village RIC barracks, which had happened on the 8th of October, 1920. They actually mined the building, but it went slightly wrong because as they were exiting and the fire had begun, they hear shouting from inside and realized that one of the volunteers was actually trapped in the building at the time. He's rescued, but he's badly burnt and brought to Flood's house on the Nace Road, where a doctor was brought to attend to him. The reason I mention this is to show you that it's rural County Dublin, so the RIC barracks is part of the story, but certainly Flood's house at Bluebell is also part of our story. The Flood sisters were very, very well known uh, because their house provided a safe haven. It was a safe house in this 
whole time of the War of Independence. They were also very generous to St. Patrick's Athletic because they provided a field attached to their farm near the Nace Road for St. Patrick's Athletic to play on. So they're very, very much part of the whole wider community and very much part of whatever was happening. This was the place you could go to. Flood's house at Bluebell wasn't too far away from Ballyfermot. It's just over the canal from the area in question. Here's actually uh, details from um, uh, witness statements because we are heavily uh, reliant on the witness statements when putting these stories together. And this is one by Joe Kinsler who was the intelligence officer for the 4th Battalion IRA, his statement relating to the time of 1921. And what's key here is that they worked in the Inchicore works. This is the railway works at Inchicore. Uh, needless to say, there didn't seem to be an awful lot of fixing up of trains going on, but certainly there's plenty going on about working in the moulding unit where they could actually make munitions and repair guns, uh, all part of the cause. The railway works uh, becomes part of the whole um, machinery behind the War of Independence for the 4th Battalion. And they, they also hold their meetings in the nearby Emmet Hall and Emmet Hall was on Emmet Road very close to Richmond Barracks. They're holding their meetings there right beside a British military installation. Basically in plain sight these meetings were taking place. Another act of defiance behind all of that was going on during the War of Independence. And you can see that they're using whatever they can Munitions are hard to come by. You have to find other ways of supplying people. The War of Independence goes on much longer than the 1916 Rising had. So munitions and armaments are a huge problem throughout it. The Intercore works, again, Joe Kinsley explains in his uh, statement, it was being raided about on average once a fortnight by the British and they never found anything. They even put a military post consisting of about six or eight men there at all times. And still, they found nothing. In the foundry department, they found they could make grenades. In fact, they were doing anything up to 36 grenades a day in the foundry. Needless to say, they got better and better at it. And, and then he said, after a while, when they were doing it, they found they could now make up to 40 or 50 grenades a week. So I wasn't joking when I said they weren't really fixing trains in the Inchicore works. This was part of the machinery behind the whole cause all through the War of Independence. Another talking point would have been this Bloody Sunday the previous November. And this is a turning point, a serious turning point in the War of Independence itself. Bloody Sunday happened on the 21st of November, 1920. One of the victims of Bloody Sunday was this lad, Joe Trainer. Joe Trainer was from Ballymount Cottages. In rural areas, all of these hamlets were interconnected. Joe Trainer is buried in Bluebell Cemetery. Bluebell Cemetery was easily accessible from Killeen across through Bluebell and just in the whole general area that we're speaking about. A big, big talking point would have been the fact that a local lad had lost his life in Croke Park on the 21st of November 1920. And you can see an image there of his grave in Bluebell Cemetery, and it was beautifully decorated by his family members uh, to commemorate uh, Bloody Sunday last year. We get accounts then of transport raids. These become a, a, a big issue. They're, they realise that it is more important to hit the machinery of the British military almost as much as to hit the military themselves. So, for example, bricks and mortar were being brought from the brickworks at Dolphins Barn. That, they would have been located at the Crumlin Shopping Centre on the Crumlin Road. It's held up. The drivers were ordered to drive to the Kimmage Quarry and the lorries were actually driven into the quarry itself. That's Eamon Camp Park on Sundrive Road today. 
The next day, the British authorities returned and they managed to retrieve one lorry from the quarry. So someday there'll be an archaeological dig up in, our, in Sundrive Park and a lorry is going to give itself up. And now we know where it came from. Here's another incident at Bluebell on the Nace Road. Again, this wouldn't have been far from Flood's farm. Two British dispatch motorcyclists were held up and their bicycles, their motorcycles and the dispatches were taken. And these are handed over to the volunteer unit in South Dublin. This is the type of activity that's taking place all around the area, hijacking the military lorry. Say the bricks and mortar that are mentioned there were being brought out to construct Baldonnell. It's the main road out to Baldonnell. So that whole route becomes a target all through the War of Independence itself. Now, there was one incident on the bridge that I came across, and this is one, sometimes it gets confused with the one that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. This is an attack on the RIC constables, uh, Sergeant Hallisey and Mulrooney and Constable Neil. Uh, the account from the newspaper uh, tells us that it happened in Ballyferm near Chapel Lizard. So when you're in a rural area, you're using the landmarks that you have. Uh, the, the killed and wounded men were members of a small cycling patrol said to have been proceeding from Dublin to Lucan. The point where the shooting occurred was, as the paper uh, reminds us, only two miles west of Dublin. Following that ambush, immediately there's retaliation and this constantly happened. Most of the houses in Clondalkin were searched by the Crown Forces and then many houses in the Inchicor district, again, were raided. Now, raids would have had a, a, a huge impact on the local area. They, you know, having your hall door kicked in probably in the early hours of the morning and the house ransacked, that leaves a very lasting memory in families and is recounted as part of the folklore of a family in close-knit communities like those in Clondalkin, those in Inchicore, those in the Liberties area of Dublin, these stories are still told today. It's stated that the employees at the Inchicore Railway Works were questioned and searched, and that would have been quite normal by, uh, by all accounts up to now. And the castle then, when it issued its uh, report later that evening, said the cycle patrol of RIC consisted of the head constable and three other police was ambushed at Ballyfermot. Um, Sergeant Hallisey was killed. And they say in the newspaper account that the other two constables were seriously injured. And that came from the Freeman's Journal. However, always good to look at these things and back them up with something else. And here I have from one of the witness statements uh, giving us an account of the fact that the volunteers of the company were actively involved in seizing British military transport, as I had ex explained to you um, just in the previous slide. But here we get a background to what was going on. On this occasion, a military transport had been taken and brought up to Bluebell near the Nugget factory. Now, some people might know Nugget Cottages in Bluebell. Um, you certainly have heard the word nugget before. You know your nugget boot polish. That's what the Camock Mills had actually turned into. It was a, a boot polish factory. The lorries brought up into this rural landscape near the mills and destroyed by burning. And the RIC men came out to investigate the, the smoke on the horizon as such. They saw them in the area and they decided they'd attack them uh, in a position near the railway bridge. And as they were heading for Lucan, the witness statement states that two were killed and they wounded one. In actual fact, one died later in hospital. So the account of the witness statement is stronger than the actual newspaper accounts of the time. I also managed to get the military uh, detail of this and it just shows you that they, they were each, each statement contradicts the other slightly. So you find that um, they, they were actually patrolling the whole area as much uh, as watching for events that were going on. Tensions were running really, really high 100 years ago in the whole general area that was covered by the 4th Battalion. 
And again, just to show you, this is a great picture I found in the city archive, and there's no denying what that building is because they're in great letters across the roof, the Nugget Booth Polish. They couldn't fit the word factory, but I think it's self-explanatory. And um, this is where the Camac Park is today, not too far from the other bridge into Ballyferm at the modern one at, K at Kylemore. But you can see at this time, that whole area has been laid out for housing and road widening as the images show. And that's probably why the city archive had this actually actual picture uh, on their file. But I was delighted to find it and I'm really pleased to include it. And of course, this is where the military transport was actually burnt on that night. I also managed to get a picture of uh, Head Constable Mulrooney's um, funeral. And this was held in the north of Ireland, which you can see that there's streams of people attending the funeral. Every single one of these incidents would have had a major impact on people's thought processes and sense of safety or unsafety, if you like, in this environment that we're talking about. Now, since Bloody Sunday, the IRA regrouped. They had lost quite a number of men in the roundup after Bloody Sunday, and they introduce a new tactic. They take on the tactic of attacking trains. In 1920, there'd been incidents at Mill Street in County Cork. There was more in um, Doro Station and Bally Lynch level crossing in Waterford. The Headford Junction in Killarney, all around that part of Ireland, there were so many incidents taking place. But then it started to gather momentum and we had incidents at Upton in Limerick and Armagh, Ennis, it just kept going. In Dublin, notably, there were incidents at Drumcondra and also at Colester and of course, Ballyfermot. So what happened? We're back to our bridge again. So on the 8th of July, 1921, it's decided they're going to ambush a troop train. We're going to look at who was involved, what did they do, and where did they do it? So I've set the scene of where they did it. The rural bridge out in Ballyfermot, the railway bridge, as after you've left the Inchicore Works, railway line, railway bridge, and it's just fields and meadows after that. Who was involved? Well, it's actually the Dublin Brigade Active Service Unit. Now, this is a photograph that Liz very kindly sourced for me. And this is taken probably about 20, um, 20 30 years after the actual incident. Imagine these, these are all in photograph, you can see they're mainly middle-aged men. At the time of the ambush in Ballyfermot, these would have been 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, young men. This is an elite unit. It's an elite unit that had been formed after November 1920. Before that, it was volunteer groups. So you found your ambushes taking place, say, at lunchtime or in the evening time when they, when they came home from the day job as such. The ASU is slightly different. They're more of a full-time active service unit. The mass arrests after Bloody Sunday had a, a huge effect on the, the ranks of the volunteers. It was completely depleted. And the authorities pretty much thought they were winning because they had rounded up so many of them and sent them off to uh, various internment camps. Uh, a lot of them went up to Ballykindler up in County Down. So this is why the IRA go for this full-time ASU. They set it up similarly to the one that they had in Cork. So it's... Uh, it's set up along the battalion lines. So we had an ASU uh, one and number one and number two. They're based on the north side, pretty much mat matching the, the first and second battalion. The third and fourth then, of course, are matching the battalions on the south side. And then there's a fifth one. They're the engineer group. They're dispatched wherever they're needed. 
number four of course is connected with the fourth battalion and that covers the area in Shikor, Ballyferm, Dolphins Barn, Thomas Street, the Liberties, all of that part of Dublin, very much synonymous with what we call South Central today. The originally, the original thought about the active service unit was to have them under the control of um, the IRA directly um, in, in an official capacity. So if you were going to do take any action, it would have to be approved at that level. However, that sort of died out after a while because all of these were guerrilla actions and they were taken pretty much, they would make a local decision, they knew what they could do locally and they had to take action pretty quickly. Uh, so it, it sort of fizzles out as such. Uh, it really wasn't feasible to control it very centrally. The main thing about them, of course, is that they're going to take the fight to the enemy. So you can see there, just done a general summary of what I was talking about uh, a few moments ago. So this is the Active Service Union. Who are the key people? Well, key number one is this gentleman. This is Porrick O'Connor. He's the F Company 4th Battalion. He's the number four section of the ASU. And later he becomes the second lieutenant of the active service unit. We're delighted uh, and like to acknowledge this photograph from his nephew Dermot. He's in uh, very actively involved in the in all of the actions that seem to take place in this part of Dublin. By the time of the troop um, troop train ambush at Ballyfermish, he's the second lieutenant in charge um, of that particular operation. Who's with them? Well, here's some of the people involved. We've got Joe McGuinness there, you can see again, 4th Battalion. Uh, we also have uh, George Nolan. And the other one from the 4th Battalion is Lawrence Martha uh, there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Pat McRae, he is actually uh, from B Company of the 2nd Battalion, and he's also involved in the squad. So he's involved in this action, and there's a particular reason for that, which we we'll mention in a couple of moments. He, he's also the driver for this event, so that makes him very important uh, in the ambush story itself. We also have Lawrence Murtha, I mentioned him there. Uh, his photograph is at the bottom of the screen, and most of them on the screen here are 4th Battalion. And in addition to this, these are the volunteers that are involved. James or Jimmy McGuinness, and he's the man who actually has the Thompson submachine gun on the day. Another thing that's a key feature of the ambush in Ballyfermot. Other people there are Edward Byrne, Patrick Lanigan, uh, Liam Keane, Daniel Jevons, he's also ASU, Michael Carroll, and Michael J. Stack, uh, Michael J. Stack, we have one or two accounts from him um, as part of his particular witness statements of this particular uh, event. George Nolan, he is uh, the, uh, the he, he notes that the tactic now is actually to um, uh, attack the trains. Remember we mentioned that earlier, that it would be about if they had moved it up to um, attacking the trains. And here he sees, he mentions in his actual witness statement that orders were sent to the section commander, who is, of course, Pori O'Connor, that a troop train would be proceeding from Dublin to the Curra on a certain morning and that it was to be attacked at Ballyfermot. So now we know exactly the background to the event and the people involved. Who's the target? Well, the target is the, um, the Gordon Highlanders. Now the Gordon Highlanders are actually one of the groups of military that have now been brought into Ireland by the British establishment. The problem is the depletion in the ranks of the Irish regiments. Post-World War I, it was no longer fashionable to be 
a member of the British Army. By necessity, a lot of people still were involved, but let's say the enthusiasm had gone out of the whole thing. So now Britain is faced with this difficulty of how to actually manage Ireland. And the only way of doing it is by bringing in her troops from other regiments who wouldn't normally have been serving in Ireland. On this particular day, it's the Gordon Highlanders who are going to be on the train that's heading out from Houston. It's expected that they're heading south, where they're really needed down around Cork and Limerick area. Uh, but they're one of a number of many British Army units which were now being deployed as the Irish situation was, was really hotting up and becoming quite significant at the time. And what's the plan? Well, again, if we go to one of the people that we met earlier, George Nolan, he tells us it's a fairly simple plan. Three men were to take tins of petrol from a pony and car. So remember the means of transport at this time were pony and cart, bicycle and walking. The men were to bring along with pieces of sacking. So we have petrol, tins of petrol and pieces of sacking. The sacks were to be saturated with the petrol and thrown on top of the carriages as this particular train would pass under the railway bridge. One man in our party, armed for the first time with a Thompson submachine gun, this is another thing that makes the whole story of Ballyfermot quite significant. He was to spray the tops of the carriages with fire and light the saturated petrol sacks. George also tells us that they took up position as ordered. Four of them were on the bridge and Jimmy McGuinness with the Thompson submachine gun was one of them. The remainder of the section were at both sides of the railway behind the embankment. So you remember earlier on, we saw how undulating the sides of the railway were, probably going back to when it was originally dug out. The Thompson submachine gun was uh, a sig significant, and there's a couple of other little things in this story that bear highlighting. For example, I did mention that ammunition was a problem. So this is where the ASU, the IRA, became very inventive. Fire was a weapon too. So this is where we get the petrol and the sacking, something that we can set on fire. It's as good as a bullet. They had the guns, but they may not necessarily have had the ammunition. And this is a huge problem now, at this, certainly at this stage in the War of Independence. They had their grenade factories. We know that from what we saw earlier, in, particularly in the Inchicore works. Um, the whole 4th Battalion are heavily involved in all of this manufacturing of grenades, of finding ways of using new um, means of taking the fight to the enemy. So fire is a key weapon here. The Thompson submachine gun was very important to the IRA. Uh, these would have come from America and it's funded by Han Miguel. At this particular time, the one that's out at the bridge in Ballyfermot is only one of two that were available to the IRA at the time. The Thompsons had actually been trialled out in the casino in Marino to see how effective they were in the tunnels underneath the casino there in Marino. The IRA had ordered 500. They hadn't come um, at that stage. Um, I think a number of them were actually impounded before they actually got here. Who are the five men on the bridge? We've actually been able to identify them. Parik O'Connor is on the bridge along with Michael J. Stack, Joe McGuinness, George Nolan, and Jimmy McGuinness with the Thompson gun. So now we have the perfect setting as this train leaves. The supported, supported men are all in this embankment area on the other side of the bridge. So they're hiding behind those little hillocks and hiding behind the embankment itself. And they're all uh, armed with their own handguns. Again, you can see how rural the whole landscape is. 
Taking it from Michael J. Stark's um, witness statement, he describes the ambush uh, in great detail. Just to bring us in, he, sp he starts this story there by the mentioning the fact that Jimmy McGuinness is on the bridge with his Thompson gun. His description is quite telling. The remainder of the section took up positions on the bank of the railway line. When the train, which we were expecting, we know they were expecting it, it passed Inchicore, a signal went up. So this train is being watched the whole way out from Houston. There would have been eyes in Houston. There would have been eyes in Inchicore. There were eyes in Ballyfermot, letting the lads know the train is on the way. This is in the days long before we had mobile phones and, and such things. When the train entered the tunnel at Ballyfermot, Michael Stack is the one who pours the petrol onto the roof of the train. Porrick O'Connor lights the sacks on the petrol soaked roof and McGuinness opened fire with the Thompson gun as the train emerged from the tunnel. The section on the bank opened fire with their revolvers as the train went through. By this time, the train was well ablaze. The grenade men then came into action, and by the accounts in the witness statements, they say the casualties were heavy on the British that day. So the account is quite graphic, quite descriptive, but we can see it from the setting and the build-up that we've had to the top tonight. It's reported in the papers and, and Liz very kindly sourced these from the Leinster leader. And again, you can see train bombed. So the, the effect of the grenade is, is, is hugely important on this as well. There is a civilian casualty mentioned in the newspaper reports and several people were also injured on the day. General Military Headquarters at Dublin, in an official report, gave a statement to the newspaper, and here we have it backed up that it contained a party of the Gordon Highlanders. It was bombed and fired between Clondalk and Inchicore. We know exactly where, the bridge in Ballyfermot. Several civilian passengers were wounded, one of them very seriously. The explosions of the bombs and the sharp rattle of the machine gun and rifle fire were heard distinctly over a very, very wide area. In a rural setting, anything happening on that railway line would have been heard. Bluebell, Glendalken, Ballyfermot itself. We get a further description of the bullets of the attacking party. How about this? Rattling against the train and smashing the windows. It says that none of the soldiers were struck, but at least four civilian passengers were injured by bullets or fragments of bomb and glass. The injuries of three were not very serious, but here we have the details of the actual civilian casualty on the day. John Rossiter, he was badly wounded. In fact, he had his leg severed in the whole incident. And his other leg was actually uh, damaged, injured in other places. Now we know a little bit about John Rossiter. Sadly, he is the father of 11 children. He was an employee of a man called JJ Parkinson, who was a well-known Curra trainer. And he, he was actually taking horses back from the races to the training um, establishments down in the Curra itself. Quite sadly to see a, a, a civilian caught up who's just doing his daily work and caught up in the whole incident in Ballyfermot. There's another account from the Leinster leader as well, which gives us a, a scene inside the train. So this can be quite graphic, but it just gives us an idea of what it was like on the other side. And again, the scene of the ambush, Ballyferm Bridge. The party of rebels had made their preparations. The train appeared, some posted on the bridge as if they'd taken up positions on the embankment on either side of the permanent way. When the train reached the bridge, the signal for the attack was given. Heavy fire was opened from both sides at the soldiers sitting in the carriages. The attackers had placed the machine gun in position and drums of ammunition were emptied at the train, while some of them used revolvers and automatic pistols other hurled bombs. We know they're the grenades. 
At some time, those who were stationed on the bridge poured petrol on the wagons and threw down burning rags in an attempt to destroy the military equipment. The destruction of the military equipment was pretty much as big a target as the Gordon Highlanders themselves. The soldiers returned far, leaning out of the windows. A wild panic took place among the civilian passengers. There was a hurled scramble for safety under the seats in the carriages. Those who were unable to secure this shelter lay prostrate on the floor and in some compartments of the train, as many of two or maybe three people were actually lying on top of one another. This is an account from the Leinster leader on the 16th of July. This is a number of days after the incident itself. This was the headline that accompanied the incident. And this certainly wasn't the headline that they were expecting to, um, to see following the attack on the train in Ballyfermot. You can see it's the double headline. Peace conference resumed, train attacked near Dublin. They had expected the train attack to dominate the newspapers. They had an inkling that peace was in the offing. Peace was actually called later that day. So we get this wonderful headline marking the end of the War of Independence and the beginning of the truce era. It's the last major action of the War of Independence. The Headline shocked those that were involved in the event. It was the last thing that they expected. They thought there might be a stop press announcing the incident on the train. Um, and the fact that the peace conference resumed hints at that the end is in sight. The end of the conflict is certainly in sight. And when it ended, it actually ended very quickly. The truce terms, fighting ceased. This is the Saturday newspaper. And it basically tells us that the restrictions are off from noon the following Monday. There's a nice little piece there in the middle, uh, Tevilleur's message to the British Prime Minister, I am ready. So all of this, the guns are silent, there's better times ahead, the hostilities have ceased. And the last action was the ambush of the troop train at Bally Fermish. And then pretty much it was nearly all over. The Irish hostilities were to cease on that day. Official statements were released and the key players that are involved in this, this time are Lloyd George and advice to the people of Ireland from Eamon de Valera. This is the independent the way it reported it on the 11th of July. Michael Strack in his statement um, mentions this and in some ways he, he connects it to Ballyfermot. He said Ballyfermot incident was a glorious send-off for the active service union the unit after a hard struggle against an enemy that was superior in strength and arms but not in courage. The truce was declared the following Monday. From May 1921, well, of course, we're, we're coming up on this anniversary of partition, but it was going to happen because the Act had been passed in 1920. The Government of Ireland Act that created Northern Ireland had already been passed. But with the coming of the truce of the 11th of July 1921, post-ceasefire talks commence. By December 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty is signed effectively ending British rule, the 26 counties of Ireland. And by December 1922, the Irish Free State is created as a self-governing state with dominion status. That's the foundation of the Republic that was to come. The six northeastern counties were to remain in the UK, but 
that was worse to come. And I suspect we will be talking about things that are worse to come in the next little while because we have a whole other story to tell all through 1922-1923. I just want to thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk and could follow the story as clearly as possible. It has been a voyage of discovery um, investigating the story, which all started with a small newspaper cutting, sparked my curiosity, called on the assistance of, of Liz, as I do for so many things, and between us we pieced it together to try and build the image of the events of that particular day in Ballyfermot, one the last Dublin action of the War of Independence. Thank you all very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Cathy. That was absolutely fabulous. Overall, too soon. <laughs> it was really enthralling. Time just flew. Uh, we're going to pass you back to, uh, to Liz, I think, who has been monitoring comments and questions. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, Cathy. Brilliant. Yes, there is uh, questions and comments coming in. And just like to say a huge thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, and uh, we've got people tuning in from all across Ireland. Uh, say a big hello to Francie in Belfast, uh, Tomas in Clare. Um, Cathy's following on from Tomas, uh, his talk last week. But some really interesting comments. And again, everyone, um, I have Facebook, I'm monitoring, so if anyone has any more questions, throw them in. Um, but Eamon Bowen, hey Eamon, how's it going? Um, Eamon just uh, made a comment earlier, Cathy, and you, you did really set the scene, and that's one thing you always do. You really describe the areas because they are so different 100 years ago. Um, but Eamon Bowen uh, just made a comment that the houses, some of the houses in Cammock Place, um, they're built by the British military uh, to accommodate... Wow of the wounded soldiers that had returned from the, the Western Front, um, mostly those who had actually won or been awarded medals. Right. The, the British Legion looked after them until the 1940s. Um, and then we have Dermot uh, Bretnock. Hey, Dermot. Um, and he chatted to a man who knew someone who worked in Inchicore Works. Um, <laughs> and he was told that he saw a grenade mould. Um, are there any surviving artefacts? Um, well, well, I know myself, there are surviving uh, grenade moulds. Some of them are like just photographs of them. I know there are some from the country, Dermot. Um, Martin Bob O'Dwyer, I think, in his one of his Tipperary books, um, had one. And Porrick Ogo Rourke, in his book, Revolution, there was a photograph of the grenades that were made by the IRA. And, and Kadi, they had these foundries across the, the, the city as well. Yeah. yeah, they did. There's certainly one in Thomas Street. I know that for a fact. Um, but I think it's the skill set, Liz. It's more the skill set that people who had worked in the Inchicore works over the since the 18 the middle 1800s and um, so the, the area had people who were skilled in foundry work railway work and um, working in a molding working in a you know it, 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 working with steel working with uh, anything like that and these these skills transfer over very nicely when you're trying to run a revolution or run a war of independence or whatever it is you're running um, and we made full use of it quite obviously um, and certainly you would have had people from the Liberties working out in Inchicore. We, we get accounts of people, you know, getting to work, going up by the old canal, things like that. Um, so, as I say, we, we drew on our strengths. We drew on what we had. And certainly they used fire as a weapon because at this stage, ammunition for guns is a problem. And it, it is a problem. It's an acknowledged problem um, for the, the IRA at this stage. Um, and, you know, even the source had dried up because after World War I, an awful lot of the returning soldiers dumped their arms in the direction of the IRA. But we're now in 1921. We were, we're a good few years post World War I. That source had dried up too. And I'd suspect the British authorities were cottoning on to the fact that this had been an open source 
fly, if you like, uh, for what was going on in Ireland. You know, your own your own munitions are returned back on you in, in, in many respects. So, you know, we, we play to our strengths, but there were foundries all over. Um, definitely, I know of one in Thomas Street. That that was key. Um, I suppose you'd be like, we always have a bit of revolution in the Thomas Street area. It was nothing new. Um, but definitely, Inchicore was hugely important and it was stored all over the area it wasn't kept in the works so you have a variety of safe houses arms dumps i know there was one at rialto there's another one in rd street but I mean, you, there's a whole chunk of work to be done mapping all these things from all the witness statements and um i'm only scratching the surface myself so if anybody wants to <laughs> take on the mission go ahead <laughs> we'll find out where they all were you know i suppose Cathy, um, just we have to give a special mention because um a, a woman and um, that we don't know um who was mentioned by the the the, the fourth battalion members and who had the sort of unique position of being an honorary member mm. of the, the fourth battalion is nelly bushel whose yeah. house was just down the road from intercore works and and she was vital to the storing of the ammunition and the the, yeah. uh, the equipment and um, kathy that sort of ties in nicely to a, a comment from tola hi tola and um, and he, he said that uh that this attack on the Ballyferma train, and um, it's, it's a fascinating example of incendiary warfare. And this is what myself and me all be saying in the aftermath of Born of the Custom House. And um, the use um, of burning fabric, which was thrown by Joe McGuinness and petrol uh, thrown. Uh, by separately by another volunteer to set the roof um, of the carriage on fire, presages the use of the incendiary by the IRA in, in later conflicts. And then told again, he's come across lots of examples um, of uh, preparation for attacks on railways um, and it really took a battering. They really took a battering in the Civil War, possibly as a result of techniques in development at this time. And um, yeah. um, um, we do see that in the Civil War and Inchicore Works has a role to play in that because the armoured trains then that were used by the National Army were were made. Made, in. made there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I would have loved if we hadn't had the lockdown <laughs> in the preparation of this whole thing. Can you imagine the fun I'd have had in the railway archives themselves? <laughs> um, uh, you know, we were limited to what we could call on um, over the last year or so, because so many of the places have been shut. But certainly every single aspect of it could be unpicked and teased. And there's a big question mark as well as to whether there were military casualties in this event. Um, it seems that a lot of it may have been conveniently pushed under the carpet because it didn't suit the narrative, because the narrative now was one of peace. That afternoon, everything stops. So mm -hmm. the last action... We know the train is badly damaged. In fact, it continues on to Clondalk and, and pulls in to discharge the, the most seriously injured. But it is eventually left in a siding in the Curra. And I know, I think it is, Porrig O'Connor mentions that he sees that train and it's completely destroyed. So, um, you know, it, 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 there, there's a big, big question mark over whether or not there are British casualties. They're mentioned as British casualties in the witness statements, but it has never been mentioned on the other side. So that might be just one of those things that fell through the cracks because of the, the day that was in it and the, that weekend was the end of everything. So there's a lot more, I think, to the story to be unpicked in time and it will come out eventually. And that, sorry, dear Brenton, I was actually going to ask a question relating to that, that the yeah. British um, sort of didn't always admit their, their casualties. Um, yes. And yeah. we've talked about this, Cathy, especially with being mm. so close to truth, the bad publicity that this could, um, you know, receive, in, especially in England, not in Ireland, but in England, mm. with them negotiating yeah. with these terrorists, or, you know, according to them, that are, you know, doing, do, committing these acts. So don't sort of um, give the actual real details of how many were attacked. I, I would, I'd say that's absolutely true, Liz. I have no doubt because it, there was too much fire, too much, you know, this was a um, spontaneous attack on the train from the train's point of view, if you like. Uh, and there's far too much um, 
firepower and I'm using fire, you know, uh, as in, you know, light sacks on a roof of a train and, and you know, there's no casualties. So like it just doesn't, it doesn't really uh, add up. So there's, there's, again, that's something that needs to be dug into. And I, I think you've got it in one. It wouldn't have sat well um, if you, you played up your military casualties and, and with one hand and then on the other hand, you're negotiating with these same guys who, who are committing these uh, atrocities uh, in, in the light of uh, the way it would be reported elsewhere. Okay, and um, Michal, you may not get a word in here because the, the conflict <laughs> Sorry, they're just all flying yeah. in. Um, <laughs> Listen, okay. I wish I have a copy with you, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and again, because um, it has been raised, uh, Cathy, the Thompson submachine gun, um, and <laughs> there's probably, a, a, I think Dermot is maybe fishing for you to do a talk on this, but the Thompson was first used in the drum conjure train, and uh -huh. uh, Dermot would love a, a talk to know more about, um, or a talk you've done on that ambush, but that's not Cathy's uh, size. It's not my area. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! Like people, oh, we've got Kieran and um, and Christina tuning in from America. Fantastic! Oh. I'm just gonna just go through. Um, Tomas McConmara. Hey, Tomas. Um, great illustration of how Bally Fair was such a different place back in 1921, and how the echoes of those times have gone in the area. And that is one thing I can always say about Kathy. She will put you there, and she will describe by detail every little detail of what the vicinity was like. Um, Tom Loftus, very informative. Thanks, Cathy. Uh, Willie Doyle Dawn, thank you. Uh, again, Tomas, great detail. Cathy, enjoying this. Margaret Walsh in West Clare, um, tune in every week. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, Claire Watson, fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, Kieran McMullen, great talk. Jerry McCarthy, Jerry, thank you so uh -huh. much. And a big, big hello and well done from Jerry. Uh, Karina Walsh. Hey, Karina, again, great talk, Cathy. And, and Cathy, you would know this, and me, Hall, you would know this. And we have to do a plug on this book that is impossible mm -hmm. to get. But um, Sleep Soldier Sleep by Jeremy yeah, O'Connor. Yeah. He has done so Absolutely. much to tell the story of the 4th it's Battalion. Needs, it it's badly mm -hmm. needs to be reprinted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely does. If anyone, I think it's available in the libraries. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> It is, but it's a bit of a battle to <laughs> excuse the pun. Uh, it's it's hugely in demand, hugely in demand. And so the best way of, uh, I suppose, accessing that book is make friends with someone who has it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting mine. <laughs> it's, it's like healthy. You, you will not get that book. Uh, They'll probably stand over you while you read it. Yes, <laughs> like a reference library. Yeah. You know, you won't let, now, it won't be let out of anyone's sight, but absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's almost like an untold story, though. They, I mean, yeah. the 4th Battalion is much more important to the story than, I. Well, in my opinion, and maybe I am a bit partisan, but in my opinion, I feel like they're, um, they're not given credit for, you know? Um, that, uh, and it's only when you start really digging into these individual incidents that you start to uh, really discover what is going on, you know, and uh, that's why every one of them, every single incident deserves to be forensically examined. And the only way we can do that is by looking at what's published, look at the newspapers, find the witness statements, look at the pension files and try and piece it all together. And you get contradictions all the time. So then you have to make a calculated or educated guess as to what are the facts. And if you can't do that, present all the information you've got. That's what I tried to do tonight. Um, you know, but this was just one incident on a bridge in rural Ballyfermot. But it's hugely important because the book ends, Salahed Break, and brings us back to the end of the War of Independence. So it's sort of everything that happened in between are, are, are predated on these two incidents, uh, Sullahead Beg and Bally Firms. And you've clarified exactly which bridge it is, because everyone thinks it's the Kyle Moore Bridge. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> the Kyle Moore Bridge didn't exist. It didn't exist at the time. It wasn't there. The only bridge you could get over was the... Um, so, so once, it's like everything else. I always say history hides in plain sight. So... You, once you know that the Kylemore Bridge over the canal and the Kylemore Bridge over the 
railway are new, you'll suddenly see that they're new. Now, when I say new, they're built as Ballyfermot is being built, the suburb is being built. But the bridge in question is the one out at Killeen, the one very near uh, the Lawns Park. Um, and that was to link the bridge there and the bridge over the canal was to link you to the mills in Clondalk and the Killeen Mills and the mills in Bluebell. So they're all part of the Camac network of industry, if you like. And that's how we have the industrial estates all around there. Um, they evolved. Uh, you know, it was a natural progression that when we left water power, we had electric power, but the industry was still there. So it was kind of a natural progression from one to the other. But um, no, it's the bridge at Killeen. Let's <laughs> be really clear on this one. That bridge is the one we're talking about. It is not any other bridge at all. It's, it's that one. <laughs> so if you go out and have a look at it, you can see, you can actually make out the old granite or limestone in the original line of the bridge is there. And they have since put concrete blocks on top of that. So you'll all be out now having a look at the bridge and you'll see what I see. And just as an aside, uh, because I've been working with all the communities um, and with community development, there are plans to mark this incident in the summer. And as a consequence of that, the bridge is going to be given a little bit of attention. So they're going to improve the appearance of the bridge in some way or other. And I think that's nice. They're, they're the um, consequences, if you like, the benefits of highlighting a story that it'll actually get a little bit of attention that otherwise it wouldn't have got. And it, certainly it has moved up um, in importance as being a significant site as part of our revolutionary history. So I, I kind of like that side of it as well, because I... You know, it's like everything else. If you don't tell the story, it gets forgotten. If you don't forensically dig into it, it's significant may not be as obvious as it actually should be. And I hope this will help even heighten local awareness of how important it is um, in the story of Ireland. But yes, it's a local story for people in, in, who live in that part of Dublin. Brilliant, Cathy. And uh, again, just some some comments and questions coming in. Uh, so, Patrick Kilfeder. Hey, Patrick. Patrick is with us every week. Um, thank you, Cathy. Uh, you made me feel I was there and knew the people and the place. You set the scene in the background so well, which you did. And most importantly, you described what the entirety of the community coming together as one in, in fighting the enemy. Um, and then uh, Tola again mentioned this one, and because we've talked about this, Cathy, um, the another ambush was planned for Crumlin Cross later the following day, and um, was called off. Uh, it was to have involved use of forty pound mines, uh, railway mines, as well as Thompson again. Yeah, uh, mentioned several statements. Great talk, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Call and it. actually, that, that Crumlin Cross would have been uh, just to set the scene for people for that one. That would have been exactly where um, the Star Cinema used to be. You know, where the Star Bingo is held now, or Our Lady's Hospital, just on the road there, because the road widened out um, at that point. One piece taking you into Crumlin Village, and the other piece taking you out to Baldonnell. Again, it's. Uh, upsetting the infrastructure that was connected with the building of Baldonnell because Baldonnell was becoming a significantly important barracks outside of Dublin and they would bring the workers out there daily under military escort and it would be just targets you know and every time something went by something happened and and funnily as well the, the because just showing you that the regiments that they brought in the British regiments they would start singing songs from the Western Front as we're going up the Crumlin Road on the military transport. If you, you know, if you weren't planning on making yourself a target, why not sing a song and let them know you're on your way, you know, because these were the things they were actually doing, you know, um, singing in the trucks as they were going out to Baldonnell and then the lads were waiting for them as they got a very stretches along what we know today as the Drimna Road or the Crumlin Road. Um, and of course, the Halfway House is another incident that took place at the burning of the pub there. Um, but that's a story for a whole other night. Uh, there's a long story. <laughs> yeah. The anniversary, that was actually the 5th of May. Of, 
yeah. where, where yeah. you have been working with a local uh, uh -huh. yeah yeah so we, watch the space there is yeah. something going to happen about the halfway house attack yeah yeah it's we've missed the anniversary because of the pandemic but we haven't missed the commemorating the event and we will find a way of doing it we definitely will Okay, and there's still some more uh, coming in. Uh, so, uh, oh God, um, hang on. Um, oh, from Mark. Hi, Mark. And um, just like to say, happy birthday to Mark's dad, Mark O'Brien's dad. He's 95, so happy birthday, Mr. O'Brien. Um, and Mark just asked, where in Crumlin was the RIC barracks, Cathy? Oh, good question. Okay, so anyone who's familiar with Crumlin Village, um, I set the scene again, the, the Star Cinema or Our Lady's Crumlin. So you, you take the route from Our Lady's Hospital into the village. So you're coming up what they call today St. Mary's Road. And then at the end of St. Mary's Road, you turn left into the village and straight ahead of you is present day Bunting Road. Right where St. Mary's Road ends and Bunting Road begins, imagine Bunting Road's not there. It's, uh, you know, a much more recent addition to the area. That's where the RIC barracks was in Crumlin. Right. Right as you came, just before you hit the village itself, the first thing you met, St. Mary's, the old church on your left hand side and the RIC barracks right in front of you at that point and of course it's destroyed by fire <laughs> by you know who and uh, <laughs> again that's a whole other story um, but it, 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 what I was trying to highlight was you know these local incidents were happening imagine the tension in the community at the time and how freely they moved um, it'd be kind of difficult for us today to get from Crumlin across to in Shikor. we'd have to kind of go the long way around and follow the main roads in their time, 100 years ago, it was used in country lanes and across fields. And, you know, there were, there were routes that could be used and they're kind of lost in our landscape today. So, you, you, you know, you sort of have to go back in time, look at the old maps and kind of work it out. So floods place on the floods will be roughly where McDonald's is today in Ballyfermot. Um, their farm was all around there and um, they were key to the revolution as well. They're the safe house. So um, I'm very, very well known and freely admitted as such as well. And again, just a few more. Um, and I, my apologies, Aoife Niaxin, I'm sorry, Aoife, sorry. Aoife, um, did say, <laughs> thank you, Cathy, fantastic detail. Um, Cathy, just amazing. Claire, uh, Watson, fascinating talk. Um, there is another question here um, about, sorry, Michal, do you want to hop in there, Michal, while I scroll? Because I'm trying to look at both <laughs> tablet and phone. They're coming in at yeah. different points. <laughs> I was just going to make the comment that when you talked about that attack on the um, police patrol, the, the cycle patrol, there were five, five of them, and they were actually coming, for, they, they were on patrol from Lucan, uh, well, what would now be the Garda station, the RIC station there. There was a big fuss made of that later because um, most of the men were actually Catholics, uh, two of them were Irish speakers, and um, there was a big, a big attempt to raise some sympathy for them. Uh, locally, but it didn't get very far. I think, um, mm -hmm. as things were, they were seen for what you know for what they were and for the organisation they represented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I am just scrolling yeah. down because yeah, sure. uh, I just want to make sure I'm getting them all. Yeah. Because there's there's something about the Thompson. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm gonna just. Well, I know Frank has a comment up on it. But they were yes. still in use later in '69. <laughs> yes, fancy. They were still the Thompson were still in use in Belfast in '69. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Again, a, an issue for another night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, 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 yes, you get mm. completely out of that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a particularly yeah. iconic weapon. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at this stage, it, it, it was a problem, problematic weapon. Where at the time of the ambush, the the, the bridge attack, it was, they still hadn't got quite got to grips with it. Yeah. But the huge problem, of course, with that more more so even than a handgun was was, was lack, lack of ammunition first. Yeah. It used so much ammunition. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you'd fire off, you know, as much ammunition as you could get in a couple of minutes, it'd be gone. I mean, the drum held a hundred bullets, and uh, it'd be gone in no time if you weren't careful. 
such a very difficult weapon to control. It tended to, to move upwards as you fired it. Uh, so, you know, aiming it at anything other than something like a train where, you know, accuracy wasn't that important, you could do it. Mm. I, it, suppo it was, I suppose, too, from the British point of view, it marks an escalation in the, mm. the ability of the IRA as well. Oh, yeah. You know, all of these things are significant in what happens next. Uh, they are pushes towards the, the, the truce. I mean, taking on a train full of like with the 70 to 100 soldiers, horses, yeah. civilians, and this yeah. was free target, you know, um, and, a, and a machine gun being used in the process as well. That, that, that changes things completely. This isn't just blowing up a, a piece of a road and, and, and a little checkpoint or anything like that. Yeah. This is hugely different, you know. Um, no, it is. I mean, it comes back in the age of the Custom House. I mean, what De Valera had wanted there, he wanted mm -hmm. war. Not, not, not skirmishes. He wanted war, not, not guerrilla tactics. He wanted yeah. uh, things that would make the news uh, from a PR point of view that the British would find very hard to put down as, as just a sort of murder here or murder there. Mm. Um, and this, this is what he wanted, the things that would get around the world as, as big stories. Yeah. And this, this one indeed mm. did, it traveled, it traveled again, like mm. all of them. But as you say, with the, with the truth, there was a tendency to play it down yeah. uh, as much yeah. as possible. And probably the, the the casualties as well for for that reason, mm -hmm. um, but at so, some stage hopefully we we will get the full figures on it and know who how many were were hurt or or killed and yeah they lost yeah. them out of it. Mm -hmm. And yep. just to come back in just on that, mm -hmm. Dermot O'Connor tunes in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and he <laughs> says, Porrick, um, got the list of casualties off the medical corps in the Curra. So yeah. there had to be more damage. As, as Porrick yeah. explains it, the damage that was done. Um, thanks, Dermot. And Aoife again, um, my great grandfather works in Intercore Works. Is there any way to find out uh, who from the works was involved in the activity? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a great yeah. question, and um, yeah, yeah I, I don't blame don't blame her for being curious. Uh, I'm curious myself. Um, yeah. I, I don't. I think it's going to be the usual scrabble around, looking at what's been written. Not everybody left a witness statement. That's the yeah. other issue. Um, so, but the pension yeah. files are very telling. Um, the, the, the pension files have been a bit of a revelation because you mm -hmm. you get accounts say from parents or from um you know uh, spouses uh, in them which have been quite interesting to look at i know a couple of the other incidents that i was looking at as well a whole new complexion was put on the story by looking at the family ones so i would just suggest that you know irish records have turned us on turn up someday and um, we'd be able to put it yeah. together. But it's a fantastic question. Um, yeah. I didn't, I'm not sure about the railway records because genuinely I haven't seen them. Um, but I'm, I'm, I, I would pass that on to somebody else who might know more about yeah. it. Michal, have you any ideas? No, I, I, just, I was just going to say that from what I've seen in terms of the witness statements and that, it seems like uh, the railway works with, with like Guinness's you know, if your father worked there, you could get a job there. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you find one member of a family there, uh, have a look for another one. You'll probably find them in there younger as they go down. <laughs> um, I mean, I came across a guy the other day, buried here in a, a local graveyard. And, um, you know, he, he was a, uh, an Arden Turner, but he ended up getting a job in uh, Inchico Railway Works because his father worked there. Uh, and then he he was one of these who was ma who ended up making making grenades etc there as well got involved with that um, and you know railway uh, engine drivers as well so yes. that thing to get you a job in Intercore Railway Works as well mm. looked mm. like you could do that so yes there's a, a lot of them there um, I mean again um, later on in the year we'll be publishing a book by James Langton on the graveyard here uh, in Esker Graveyard in Lucan. And there's probably four or five of the people in that were working in uh, Inchicor Railway Works at some stage um, as a side to their uh, more mil more militant operations. Um, so look out for that. We'll get a couple of names out of that anyway. And there'll be links on 
for the name source as well. And uh, sorry, just a few more comments are still coming in, Cathy. Um, just uh, talking about the halfway house ambush and Michael Sweeney. Um, with this from Johnny yeah. Doyle, Michael Sweeney um, was wounded at the halfway house ambush and his mother's house at number five, Harold's Cross, was still an arms drop after the Civil War. Um, and after the war, John Joe O'Brien moved from Galbally Limerick to Kilmainham and owned the Glen of Arhello pub. And there's a fantastic oh. book about uh, John Joe O'Brien written by his son. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, you can get it, and, and that's fantastic. Everyone, you're going to leave a reading list. Um, <laughs> um, and again, Tomas, uh, brilliant stuff, Cathy, again. Um, and uh, Dermot Bretnock, uh, worth mentioning that Inchcore area also contributes to at least three volunteers to the International Brigades. Um, a plaque was erected there a few years ago. I think some of them uh, worked in the Inchcore works also. So you still have that revolutionary um, uh, tendency where there's wrongs being you know, committed that they went off abroad. And, mm -hmm. and try to help. Um, and again, Aoife, thank you. Lots more reading to be done. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. As Cathy said at the start, like, we're only scratching the surface with this. We really mm -hmm. are, aren't we, Cathy? Yeah, very much so. And, and in many, many respects, we, we really, we need to do this with every incident. You know, you need to really get that balance because some things have actually been lost. I mean, you know, I, I would have connections up around the Walkinstown area and I say to people, oh, you know, the halfway house pub that was uh, um, mined during the War of Independence and they look at you and say, no, it wasn't. You know, so like, these stories have been completely <laughs> lost and then, then they get a history lesson. But, you know, that's all the other day. But, but, you know, every single one of those incidents will be really worth um, working through them. Who's involved? Where did yeah. they come from? Find out more about them. Um, and, and it's usually sparked off by some little thing, a little newspaper cutting, a little anecdotal story mentioned, whatever it might be, and then just keep layering it. Go back and use what you can find. Um, but there's, we're only beginning. <laughs> this is going to run and run. It definitely is, you know. And that's the value of doing talks like these because everybody's chipping in their perspective and that's what we need we need so much more of that and we need to spark people's interest um i know certainly a lot of my groups out around body have a completely different perspective now of that one incident and how much it means to them because it really means a lot to people when the national story is a local story that that's that changes everything it's not just something that happens off out there in the the big bad world, it actually happened on your doorstep. And um, then you get curious and you will find things. You, you'll find them where in places I wouldn't even think of looking, you know. So, um, yeah, so I, I hope it does that good. That's my, that's my aim and my ambition with these things is to get people curious. Well, we can certainly do that, Cathy. And, uh, and something always sparks from one of your talks. Don't know is, is begins as a result of one of your talks, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and again, just more comments, Cathy, um, and questions. Um, Joseph Rain, uh, brilliant as usual. Your speakers are first class, and I would totally agree. Um, yeah. And just a question, and probably Michal, you might come in on this. Um, were the grenades for local use only or distribution throughout the country? Oh, good question. I'd imagine with, with the Prairie, they'd have to, having their own mold, their own factories, that oh. they would make them locally. Mm -hmm. No, the grenades were were, were sent out. Uh, they were, um, Kieran McMullen actually touched on this. They were sent around the country, but they were filled in the country. Okay. Oh. You, you couldn't send a live grenade. <laughs> you, know, it, it was, you can imagine the problems that would happen there. I mean, you know, they, they weren't quite the safest things. But mm -hmm. uh, around, in Dublin, no problem. You'd use them local, locally where they were made, but you sent them out to go down the country. They would make their own uh, whatever to fill them with and fill them down there and that was it but they would be cast up here and sent away and, and brilliant michael and um yeah. just, you mentioned kieran uh, christina just yeah. christina and kieran are going to have some tour of ireland when they come back 
um, because Christine has done an excellent job explaining the wares in your talk, Cathy, especially for those of us who do not travel around except yeah. for twice a year. So I think Ballyferma will be on here. <laughs> Bus trip sent to the bridge. <laughs> or train trip sent to the bridge yeah. or to the point. Yeah. Duck. <laughs> 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 and uh, Kathy, uh, Lindy, hey Lindy. Uh, oh, Lindy, great. Again, thanks, Kathy. Brilliant detail, Michael Doyle. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Kathy, you've just just the the, mm. the comments, and you'll be able to see them yourself. Um, yeah. just absolutely fantastic. Um, Kathy, you did sort of touch on it in the talk. Um, as in, and and again, myself and me all and Laz will will sort of talk about yeah. this as well. That the to target the IRA began to target the infrastructure, the supplies. And what was it that we discovered that um, the value of a horse was actually more than a soul? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I think it was something like 120 pounds was the value of a donkey. And yeah. um, the value of a soldier was probably something like 100 pounds, yeah. you know, in, in if they were doing a military calculation. Yeah. This is where it changes that the yes. um, the IRA realise that if they target equipment, yes. um, materials, the the horse. Well, remember, the horse yes. is the key mode of transport. I mean, military lorries were probably flying around the place, all right. But that's yes. about it. We, we don't really have. We're not really in the era of the motor car as yes. such yes. Um, at this yes. stage. So yes. by targeting things like that, they were getting as much. It was cost, it, it all came back to money. And so it was really, really costing the British so much money to maintain this campaign in Ireland that it was getting untenable because they were losing their equipment, their horsepower, their machinery. You know, destroying a train like that, you, they, yeah. whatever about the people getting out of it, you couldn't get the, the, the equipment out of it. So that's no. gone. That's written off. So, um, and that and that's just yeah. one. This is just one train under one bridge in Ballyfermot. Yeah. So consider all the other things that have been happening as well. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the value of a I think the value of a donkey. I had that somewhere. I yeah. think it was uh, one hundred and twenty pounds. I think yeah. was the value of a donkey or yeah. or just, that, um, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But this, but this ties back. You're quite right, Kathy. This ties back to again, uh, going back to the burning of the custom house. Mm. You know, you destroy their ability to raise money. Yeah. You know, money means they can buy things, they can pay for things. But if you take the money away, they can't pay their soldiers. Mm. They cannot pay, cannot buy their donkeys. Uh, mm. They cannot buy the hay, another thing they burned later. Um, you know, so they, they, they were, in a sense, you know, soft targets, but an easier targets. You didn't have to go after, you didn't have to kill men. You, you could destroy their ability to fight you. Yeah. And yeah, that was what they were doing yeah. with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. It all ties in every bit of it. These things as, as a round. You um, know, yeah, that's it. You have to look. Yeah. That's what I mean about looking at each things forensically. Because yeah. you're absolutely right, Michal. There's a number of accounts in the you find um, they find them in the newspapers of people complaining about the fact that the hay was all being commandeered by the British yeah. military establishment in Dublin, yeah. and when they couldn't get enough in Dublin. They then uh, took the hay from Kildare, Meath, Louth, all, all the counties around Dublin, which yeah. meant you hadn't a chance of yes. feeding your own horses, um, yeah. you know, um, and this was the only, yeah. well, it was the main mode of transport. So yeah. it, it, even things as significant as that are hugely important. That interferes with your ability to work um, yeah. as a, a civilian. So you're going to be angry with the, military establishment yeah. and then of course yeah. the British military establishment is trying to keep its own uh, books balanced here in Dublin it, it's a fascinating uh, topic yeah. and it's all and part it's, of the war yeah it's long term too if you cannot mm -hmm. feed, feed your horses or your cattle um, they're going to die and that yeah. means that next year you, you know, have nothing time, you have nothing like, and yeah. if you have nothing the government has nothing you know mm -hmm. it goes all the way down the line so mm -hmm. yes it was it was a, a simple way and in many ways to to disable what was what we were fighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, sorry, can you a few more? Um, to, uh, <laughs> Ken Larkin uh, and <laughs> uh, Ken, um, and he said Liam Kyo, um, R.E.P. Uh, tells of his father, who worked in the Inchcore Works and was from the ranch and the ranch 
provides a lot of volunteers um, and coming them on um, and is involved in both in the rise and and the war of independence which i hope would be printed this year that would be amazing because amazing. as you've shown kathy you cannot and i suppose this is a thread that has been running through the series of talks you cannot tell the national story without the local story it's just i completely a agree absolutely agree i really do and and i can see the light bulb moments i can see you know i've, I've done so many talks like this and when i mention something that people know something that they're familiar with and i can tie it into a bigger more remote story that they you know probably vaguely heard of it yeah. changes completely if you can bring it yeah. back to their own doorstep and I, I, I completely agree and i'm hugely grateful to ken it's been a joy working with ken over the last few years mm -hmm. and the group out in valley fair with sean and and suzanne and all the others i mean they're, they're just amazing what they're doing they are gathering every aspect of the history, the social story of Ballyfermot and a community. It would be an amazing study for somebody to do how a community can build, survive and sustain itself by the records that Ken and his team out there have gathered over the years. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. So a big thanks and delighted Ken was here tonight. Thank you, Ken. And thank you for those photographs, Ken. It would have been a very dry talk without them. <laughs> I'm really acknowledging all the help I got here, you know. <laughs> and of course, a big shout out to Jerry McCarthy. Who, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, again, yeah. he was just being amazing, and and especially mm -hmm. with myself and Michal at the start of all of this. Uh, he really totally. Did. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's our yeah. Republican history fairy godmother. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Christina. Christina um, from America, um, after not being able to come over in a year and a half, two missed book launches and another coming, uh, we will have to stay a month to catch up with everything yeah. you will. Uh, yeah. um, and of course, Christina's yeah. husband here and gave the talk on the weapons mm -hmm. of the, the, the war, the uh, burning of the custom house. Um, yeah. Sorry, Miala, I'll pass back over to yourself. Um, yeah. okay. Well, just a message for Christina to remind her that uh, her Hop House 13 is safe here. They're only stopping it in England, <laughs> not here. <laughs> so she can have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kathy, can, can I ask you just, because I know like both of us actually relying on but just in terms of how valuable the newspapers are to... to yeah discovering these stories and what is not necessarily told in the witness statements or the pension files or something that may be mentioned very briefly in the witness mm -hmm. statements yeah and then the new because like, i know you just the newspapers is your go-to place it is it is my go-to place so with the newspapers what you've got to remember we're so used to instant news now like you know we we, we log on to twitter facebook whatever we're on and we get the news the minute almost before it happens if you like you know it's so instantaneous the first thing you do with the newspaper check the date on the paper because it it is most likely a story written two or three days after the event so that's the first thing you've got to do because it's the we're so used to the instant world today when you're going back to those times, it wasn't that instant. You didn't have phone lines, you know, you, you know, random people had a phone number maybe with four digits in it. That's, that's all we had. So, um, you, you know, the movement of news was different. Some of it might be hearsay. So it can, it not necessarily a person on the spot giving a witness account. It might be the local gossip that makes its way into the papers. But we really are good at gossip in Ireland and we're never that far from the truth, you know? Yeah. That's another thing I've learned. So they're the key things you start with your newspaper. But remember too, your papers have a political bias. So when you look at them, um, always work out which paper you're looking at. So a really descriptive paper from the time is the Freeman's Journal. They write them like they're writing an essay for their history projects. You know, it, it, the detail is unbelievable. You'll be you'll be told, how, you know, how many horses are on the cart and, you know, four hay ricks on the bag and all this kind of, the detail is phenomenal. I mean, the style of writing is very descriptive. 
But then you might get other papers that have that other bias that are, well, it's the case today. I mean, it, you know, in, in many, we would know instinctively that some papers will have a slant that others don't. But that's what makes it all the better. If you put them all out in front of you, you are then getting the, the different accounts. So I love to start with a newspaper cutting, no matter how small, no matter, little headlines are the ones that really get me. And then I try and build the story behind that. And then you have your other sources. So your witness statements, again, don't forget, they can be written, what, maybe 20, 30, some cases nearly 40 years after the event. Um, so bear in mind that bias as well, that type of, um, you know, what, what, for, what sort of memory is it, you know, is it, uh, is it absolutely reliable? So you've got to balance all of them together. So that's why I presented it the way I did. Um, we're looking at the different newspaper accounts. We were looking at different witness statements. We're looking at different the way different things are reported. The other thing, and I'm discovering this more and more, the regional newspapers are amazing for finding things that happened in Dublin and that didn't necessarily <laughs> make it into the, the standard press in Dublin. And you find all sorts of, of, of weird and wonderful things in the regional papers. And I think in some cases it's because Dublin had this rural hinter hinterland so it had more of connections with the rural communities than it necessarily had with the city. So I think you get that lovely clash of rural, urban. So uh, don't just stick with your traditional Irish Times, Independent, Freemans Journal, whatever it might be. Go elsewhere and see what you can find in the other ones as well. And I, I know we both have found little gems in the, in the rural papers. So uh, um, well, well worth having a look at. Well worth having a look at. But then I go to census records. Um, it, it's kind of my standard now, you know, that just, okay, it's it's 10 years out at this stage. Like if we're looking at 1921, the most recent census we have available to us is 1911. But what it does show you is these communities didn't move around all that much. And if they did move, they literally moved from number one into number four or, you know, two roads away. They stayed in their communities. And I think it's what Michal was mentioning there as well, the workplace. Um, you know, you worked in the Inchicore Works. You're not going to put a big commute on yourself, you know, because uh, you can't. It's not, it's not available. Uh, the trains aren't safe. We can see that. Um, but you, but you, know what I mean? uh, um, you, you, you lived near where you worked. Um, and if you got a job, it was inevitably maybe a place where, like, your father had worked in or it was your job for life. So it, 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 it's to, you don't really understand the whole story unless you put yourself in the moment and work out what's going on. So word of caution with the papers, look at the date it's publishing and don't stop there because you will find more information um, in the subsequent weeks. Um, we had it with the Brunswick Street um, incident where we actually found a missing casualty because she died about a month later. Um, and, and ironically, it was a woman that was left out. So, um, you know, so keep going, you know, um, keep going and go ahead and remember the times you're dealing with. So they'd be my little pieces, but definitely my newspapers. I usually start there and work backwards. <laughs> so see how I get on. And and we always sort of do a plug um, with each talk. Uh, Irish newspaper archives, if anyone hasn't, like it is available when the in the libraries when they are open for free. But um, at the moment, Irish newspaper archives we're doing a discount code, mm -hmm. um, and it is a great resource. It's a fantastic resource. So if anyone um, you know, wants to have have a, a treat yourself to something but it's addictive as well like you oh, yeah. 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 Read yeah. The papers um can a few more to, uh, questions and comments um uh, johnny doyle uh mccullough was the man taking hay etc during world war one based at the royal hospital in Kilmainham. Uh, lusk was a remount center rds was a loading point for horses on the western front it's right. fantastic the little bits of information mm. that, that come in from everyone like it, it's it's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Um, and 
uh, we have, uh, uh, and this is it's coming from Christina and Aoife again, and, and thank mm. you everyone so, so much. But uh, thank you all for these wonderful talks. The only good thing that has come out of lockdown. Myself and me, I think yeah. uh, we're living for the 25th of May. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Aoife uh, couldn't agree more. And I have to say, and I, th I think Michal agrees with me here, like the... Yeah. the we knew we had a, a, a great, uh, uh, you know, cash of guest speakers um, and we knew they wouldn't disappoint and we were yeah. just so delighted that we were able to learn how to use Zoom to share <laughs> these talks with yeah. you um, because we certainly wouldn't yeah. have had this reach if we were doing the conference on the day um, yeah. you know, so it's, it has been wonderful mm -hmm. um, and yeah. thank you all really for tuning in every week because you know yeah. you are helping to to spread the word and these stories mm. mm -hmm. I'll, I'll yeah. hand over to you Michal. i'm going to do one more scan yeah I'll... okay have another look um yeah I, i'm just going back to what you were saying kathy about sources um don't rule out sort of family stories yes that's there's that's, usually yeah. a gem in there they're probably not true but there's a gem in there somewhere. Yeah. Which, yeah. when you get to it, a little nugget there that is, it's based on truth. Family stories are really based on, on falsehood. Mm. Because you'll get a little bit of truth in them somewhere and you'll find it. You'll find it. It's, it's not, absolutely nothing to do with this. But I thought you're talking about hay and um, collected in, in, in Kilmainham, just being collected in Kilmainham. Uh, it's a story I think I mentioned to you before and I never gave you the information on. But George Dunn, the go governor of Kilmainham, was done for stealing hay from Kilmainham was accused of stealing it. Uh, they used it as bedding for the prisoners. And he was taking it out to Ballyfermot, to his farm out there, for his animals. They used hay from the, from, from the cells. <laughs> and he, he was caught over that in later life. So there's a reverse situation going on there. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. You know, 100 yeah. years earlier. Yeah. The, the value of hay <laughs> takes on a whole new meaning, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Fascinating. It all goes there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you will find these. Um, uh, I mean, the the newspapers are, are absolutely fabulous. But also, if you can get to look, the foreign papers, mm. you, get to, you know, uh, there's uh, every now and then you find the the, the uh, foreign archives, the particular American ones. But you go to um, Australia where you can get onto them for free down there. Um, uh, what's a trove, isn't it? The one down there. Um, but you can get onto their papers for free, and you will find Irish stories there, because there's such a huge Irish community in these places. Mm. And they carry Irish stories, and they'll often carry them in depth. They carry interviews with people. They'll carry life stories down in, in, in their papers down there. So they're, they're they're well worth looking at as well. It, you know, it's not just in in Dublin or just in Ireland or wherever your event happens. Look around the world for it as well, and uh, you know, it just means you never stop looking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. That is the problem. Very you know, much so. And, and I mean, you can end up enjoying the journey too much, I think. Mm. Oh, God. Yes, <laughs> yes. We, yeah. we would be testament to that, <laughs> yes, Michal. We we that. Yeah. We can certainly agree to that. And yeah. um, I, oh, I'm just going through yeah. again. Yeah. There is, and just sort of following on from that newspapers, uh, the, the, the in relation to newspapers. Um, and it is quite true, Johnny Doyle says, the papers often carry erroneous stories that are comedy gold. And again, yeah. we, we'd be <laughs> to testify to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for example, yeah. Austrians captured during the Easter Rise and Sinn Féin airplanes in the west of Ireland, Renault <laughs> Frank being smuggled into Ireland from Russia. <laughs> yeah. was, was alive and well all the way yeah. back then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give one more. Yeah. One more scroll, but um, Kathy again a resounding success as yeah. I knew it would be. But I suppose, and it because probably people were thinking as well, why were we doing a talk on an event that happened six weeks after, after. the morning of the custom house? Mm -hmm. Um, and it does actually tie in, but t tonight's yeah. date was significant because it is the 8th of May. The event happened on the 8th of July, and we thought that this would be a nice way to mark it. In, in mm -hmm. some, this might be something that is missed, Cathy, in yeah. the scenery um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. of the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and I would agree there, and I, I will do anything to promote the area 
that I am working in. I, I really mean that. And I and it was a thing, it was a decision I made very early on. And um, because my whole plan was to find the big stories and bring them back to the areas they belong in. And I think you get a whole different perspective of the truth if you look at it from the Ballyfermot perspective, you know, if you, if you put it from the way that was the last significant event and all, all the things that were cancelled after that because of the big machinery that was working away between Dublin and London. Yeah. And, you know, it, they're the key things. It's, it, you know, it, history could be heavy going if you don't really look oh, at yeah. the other things that were going on behind it. And yeah. I, I do think it's a significant, the, the power the, uh, the the daring of the IRA is the, the confidence of them yeah. is growing constantly, even though with all the issues that are going on, ammunition, whatever might, else was happening. And this obviously is a turning, uh, is something that twists it around and bring, mm -hmm. brings it back to um, the mm -hmm. truce. Because if, if the truce didn't happen, the alternative was full military um, yeah. invasion of Ireland, really. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the consequences of that would have been absolutely horrendous. Yeah. Uh, it would have been a, a war, a complete war, breaking out on yeah. this island. Um, so it just took brave people in many respects to stand yeah. back and say, hang on a minute, it, yeah. enough yeah. is enough, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's brilliant if you can bring it into a story. <laughs> <laughs> to be in Ballyfermot. Thank you. <laughs> the gods are working on my side, I can say, you know. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm delighted to be able to kind of have something yeah. as significant as that and make yeah. it as part of the, the bigger story as well. Right. I, I, I think is one of the things that the story shows is that the IRA was a learning army. Yes, yes. that's exactly right. It, yeah. it learned from yeah. what had happened. It learned from the material that it had and it could use. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we don't have guns, what do we do? We throw a, a, a patch of salt rag onto it. I thought yeah. we'd try and top and set fire to it. Uh, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you know, we'll, we'll burn their lorries, we'll burn their hay, we'll, you know, we'll use mm -hmm. fire easy enough to do. Um, as opposed to having stand up fights, whereas the British army were coming in and was still thinking. They had their generals who'd come out of the First mm -hmm. World War and they were thinking conventional fights and they were trying to adapt and they were struggling trying to do that. Mm. And this is why we saw the Black and Tans and the uh, auxiliaries come in, of course, um, you know, but they couldn't be controlled. So, so you had an uncontrollable army and an overly controlled army against a learning army. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was just an incredible thing. To, you know, if, if you can stand back and be, be objective about it, just yeah. to watch how that developed is actually, actually incredible. Mm. And when you look at the numbers involved on both sides, you know, uh, no, I, I, I think this with the custom house and all the things that followed uh, showed, and, and indeed going back to Easter the previous year when they started burning tax offices and RAC off, uh, uh, the, 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 um, barracks, etc., just that they were learning all the time, adapting, mm -hmm. changing, and it made it very, very difficult to fight an army like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Constantly changing his tactics. And also, if you've lost the people, Michal, you know, you lost. Yeah. And um, the the Ireland yeah. which it started to really galvanise with the anti construction mm. one, which Liz has covered so well in the past, and um, yeah. that, that united people who would never be united in a fifty. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like people were talking to people who would never be yeah. connected. But so yeah. that was the beginning. I you know so this yeah. if you take the whole thing in around. Um, yeah. You can actually track the change in the public mood from 1913 right through yeah. 1916, right through to yeah. this particular time. And when you've lost the local mood, yeah. you've yeah. lost the war. You've completely yeah. lost the war. Absolutely. Um, and and I, somebody spotted that eventually. And, and they could yeah. see the daring do. Right. They were just going to keep bringing the fight to the enemy. They didn't. Yeah. They, they, they were fearless in that respect. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And I am just scanning down through again because the comments are still coming in. Um, again, great talk. Um, well done. Fascinating talk. Um, again, just, uh, mm -hmm. just absolutely. Uh, is, <laughs> yeah, it's just praise for you, Kathy, which is totally well deserved. Um,
and and again, and there's lovely com comments coming in for to ourselves, Michal, for organising this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We're we're on a roll leading up to the 25th. Yeah. We've been planning this for 12 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we didn't think we'd yeah, have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we make haste slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, but but we've been learning as well. We've been practicing yeah. every year with our conferences and they've been getting better. <laughs> well, I'm so delighted, Cathy. Yeah. This, this is the first week in a long time that uh, we've had no hiccups, really. You know, so. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh God, Kathy, we've had you nearly on for two hours. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to do one more quick scan, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. Is there okay. any um, events, because I know you've been extremely busy with the story in residence, doing a lot of online talks. Um, is there any that are coming up in the coming weeks that you want to give a plug to um, or anyone you want to give a shout out to? Um, well, I've been doing the, the, the trouble with the lockdown is every time we did a talk, the next thing is I get a message and say, oh, I missed it, when are you doing it again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for anybody who missed the Poddle talk, for the final time, I hope, for a while, because I actually know the river intimately at this stage, um, I am doing it for the Harrods Cross Festival on Monday night at 8 o'clock. And um, so if anybody wants to... Uh, Tune in for that one. I'm sure they'd be delighted uh, to get good numbers because, again, like all the local festivals, they've had to go online uh, and we will be doing things online for the foreseeable future as well. Uh, another thing that I'm doing, um, I've been doing this during the lockdown, talk, talk about finding religion. Um, I've been doing the parish webcams um, because if yeah. you think about it, the infrastructure is there and you I just rock up and do a talk. So I'm on the Drimna Parish webcam on Tuesday, um, and we're just going to do um, a, a talk just generally about Drimna, uh, the Drimna area. So it's been beautiful for people who have been housebound during um, the pandemic. Um, a lot of people like to tune in, say, for the morning mass, and they just leave the webcam on. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I appear on the screen <laughs> doing, doing something. Yeah. And uh, the parishes have been noting that their numbers are going up when I'm on. So uh, I don't know whether I'm being used That's for another, another mission or not. Um, and then one other little thing that we are doing, and this is quite a nice little thing. I'll just let the, um, the audience here tonight in on a, a, a project that we're working on. We've been getting children involved in writing down their memories of COVID. So uh, we have a number of schools that I've been working with and we're encouraging the children to create their own primary source. And it's just an A4 page, something of their memory of COVID, whether they decide to write a story, a poem, a song, or draw a picture. We really don't mind what they do. And I got agreement then with the City Archive to accept these and bring them into the city archive. And we had to manage it okay. a particular way for child protection. But yeah. said all of that, um, my ambition is that the children will make their way to the archive to find mm -hmm. their record. Um, mm -hmm. So you get a full meaning of what an archive is, what a primary source is, and you're only in fifth class. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. uh, and I've done that now with nine schools um, so far. Um, just I turn up on Zoom in the classroom and they get to ask the historian various questions. Um, key questions have been, what's the difference between archaeology and an archive? I won't tell you the way archaeology was pronounced, but you got the general idea. <laughs> um, so, so they're little things that I've been involved with yeah. doing. But what I'm hoping is there are upcoming historians in the next generations. And this might be the beginning of just understanding the difference between a primary source, a secondary source, how you create one and what an archive is and how it works. So little things like that, they might not sound like much, but to me they're big projects and um, I think they're important and um, just might make history a bit more fun and yeah. if you make it wow. fun, it might have a knock-on effect for English, for your way you debate, the way you question um, and I must say the children of our area are amazing. They have no inhibitions. They have no problems asking the historian <laughs> anything. <laughs> so it's just great to see them with that confidence um, at yeah. that age. And it's, it's just a joy to work with. So that's the other little project that we have. We're hoping it will turn into 
a children's archive held in the city archive. So um, that again would be very useful for anyone studying childcare, studying to work yeah. with children, but also for the children's perspective of things as well, which often gets lost in yeah. the story yeah. industry. So yeah, yeah. So oh, that's as, as we've discovered, Cathy, that the children's story is so important to oh yeah, it's huge, huge, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, overlook them. Um, there's just a few more questions. Um, Dermot, um, is there a poster or event for the Puddle Talk? Uh, Dermot wants to publish it um, on shared oh. sites. Yeah. And Mark Jenkins, hey Mark, you came. Thanks, in. Mark. Um, yeah. And thanks, Mark. I know you're busy. Um, if you look up Harold's Cross uh, Festival page, so. the details will be there. So everyone, Harold's Cross Festival page, and um, the details of Cathy's talk will be there. Yeah. Um, and these are probably out of sync. These questions. Um, but. Uh, uh, Dermot said something about house to house fighting in cities. Uh, oh, that's obviously from yeah, the fake news. Um, yeah, house to so house in cities, as the US in Puerto Rico, I think, yeah. and the Russians in Petrograd. And Mark Jenkins, uh, you must check out the Australian newspapers. Thanks, Michal. I'm obsessed <laughs> with the archives. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, Mark. And Mark Jenkins, uh, if anyone, um, really, if you don't follow this page, you should. Um, old oh, Ireland oh. and Cathy Olden. What's, what's Mark's page? Old, uh, old Ireland, isn't it? And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll look it up. Um, but Mark's page is fantastic. fantastic. If, yeah. Um, yeah. if you haven't started following that, and I'm going to look that up just before we we do go. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to type in here multitasking now. Old <laughs> and new photos. Just let me double check. Oh. Have you got it there, Michal? Uh, no, I don't have them here. No. Okay. Um, I am. Connected, I haven't been following it all right, but uh, yeah, I will look that up. Um, just yeah. before we finish. um, or Mark, if you're on here, put up the name of your, your Facebook yeah. page. Um, and he says, uh, again, thanks to all involved with talks now. You have only been able to dip in uh, to the live post, but fabulous. All, um, and of course, you can catch up, Mark, on our YouTube channel. Yeah. All talks go up there. And Mark is related to uh, the Michael Sweeney that was mentioned earlier yeah. that took part mm. in the halfway house attack. Yes. Yes. Um, and then Tola, again, just in relation to the Ascendry Warfare, uh, the IRA had at that time developed a functional compact clockwork incendiary, and he's seen the original sketch plans. So, um, as you say, Michal, they were a learning army, yeah. they were adapting oh, okay. oh. all the time. Um, yeah. Okay, sure. everyone just hang on. For, if you want to talk there, Cathy amongst yourselves, and Michal, I'm just going to look up my <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's absolutely great. I'll be taking yeah, a little break, actually, yeah, um, yeah, over the next yeah. few weeks because now with the lockdown lifted, we just feel like I need to get out of the house for a little while and start exploring again. So, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, what you yeah. should have been doing here is getting, getting, getting some room service in, though. You think <laughs> different. You get cups of tea or coffee or something stronger. Keep you going. You're, yeah, I, but I mean, Look, I think all you've proved so far tonight is what I said at the beginning, your enthusiasm. It's infectious. It's incredible. It's absolutely wonderful. And I think people like you are what we need here. We need them locally, and we need that to generate through to the, the national heroes, we, uh, historians. They, they get stuck. They just mm -hmm. see a big picture. They can't see the detail. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you don't see the people, I mean, Liz talked about the word archaeology earlier. You, you did what it was called. <laughs> I mean, archaeology is what you've got left when you take people out. Yeah. Mm. You know, and you need people to make history. Mm. And, you know, you talk about them. Liz talks about them. I talk about them. Um, you know, so many other great local historians do this. Um, but at, at a bigger, a higher level, there's, there's, there's a cache of historians who don't see them, who don't come down to them. I just wish they would. They, mm. you know, they, they would be better historians for it, mm. I think, if they could do that. Anyway, that's my rant over. <laughs> I, I found it and I, I put it up there. So uh, I yeah, get it. for Mark. Um, and I, again, Michal, like we, um, we are yeah. the, the prime examples of this, of, you yeah. know, l just listening to, just reaching out and seeing, you know, what is out there. And thankfully the people have responded to us mm -hmm. because we certainly could, yeah. would not be telling the stories that we are telling today without the the the, the, pe the people um who yeah. know an awful lot more than the academics in a lot of cases mm. yeah. um mm. us um 
enough said there. Um, okay, I think that is all the questions, Cathy. Oh my God, you, you need a strong uh, drink after this. Um, uh, I'm just going to do um, a plug for next week's talk. So I'm going to share my screen and see if yeah. this works. Uh, let me see. No, I'm at a little news. Uh, okay. Can I share mine? Yeah, have you, have you got it there, Michal? Yeah, if I'm up to share. Okay. Um, there it goes. Um, oh, sorry. What I'm just sharing here is R1 for the, um, if you can see oh. that, where you can get all these talks back. Okay. Brilliant. Tinyurl.com, May 25, burning. Okay, uh, and now I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I have it here, we help. Yeah, okay, you got it. I got it there, yeah. And so everyone following on from uh, Kathy's talk, I'm delighted um, to announce that Joe Mooney of the Eastwall History Group is going to give us um, do a talk for us next week. Now, this Joe is is amazing. If any of you um, have not seen the film that was made, a documentary made by the East Wall History Group, um, it's the uh, Peace and War in a Docklands Hotel, and it's about the attack on the LNWR Hotel on North Wall, which has a direct link to the Custom House. Joe um, is originally from Crumlin, but um, Joe lives in East Wall. Um, and him and Hugo McGuinness do amazing work down there. Um, so Joe, he's going to do the talk for us next week. And the talk is called, and I just have to move this out of the way so I can get the full title. Um, the Old Spot by the River, Liberty Hall, Custom House and the Dublin Dockland Rebels. So everyone, it's the usual time, 8 o'clock. Um, and it's on the 15th of May. And we would be delighted to um to, to see us all there. It is going to be a, a, a brilliant talk. And as I said, if you haven't seen the documentary, if you go onto the East Wall for All webpage, and also they do have their own Facebook group, the East Wall History Group Facebook mm -hmm. group. Um, they have a YouTube channel as well. And you'll be able to see the documentary there. It was uh, premiered on the 11th of April, the centenary of the attack on the LNWR Hotel. So um, that would be a, a good one to tune into next week to talk with Joe Mooney. Um, right, I will just do one more scan because I'm just, um, yeah. I don't want to miss any, Cathy, but. Um, Mischievous it, one there from Jenny Doyle. <laughs> Can the team take us through their library of books? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <forget this. laughs> oh. Uh, I don't think Zoom would last long enough. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do a whole presentation, me hold yourself. <laughs> yeah. Presentation. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we've I think mm. we've gotten all the questions and my apologies to anyone if I did miss mm. any comments. Um I think that yeah. is Oh, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think. Yeah. So I suppose yeah. everyone, again, thank you so much for for tuning in. We we really could not do this without you because we would end up just being talking to ourselves. Um, <laughs> we always learn yeah. something from you. So after after talk, myself and Michal always have like yeah. a a powwow and go. I didn't know yeah. that. I didn't know that. Oh, oh my God, this is it. So we always get something Every from time. you, the yeah. audience. So it's yeah. great to have that um, that that interaction with you, um, because yeah. I know Michal and Kathy, we, mm. we do not know everything, and we don't mm. admit to know everything. So we're yeah. always willing to learn more, and you yeah. have been so great, so gracious in giving us that yeah. information. Yeah. Um, can I just say, um, on a personal level, Kathy is, is a very dear friend of mine and um, I'm just so thrilled that she took part in the, the events for the centenary of the morning of the Custom House. Um, as Michal said, it oozes of Kathy. She cannot hide her love for the, the, the area where she was raised, where she's from, which is Dublin A. And um, if you didn't know that before tonight, um, Cathy is a bit biased about the 4th Battalion area because it is her stomping ground. Um, <laughs> a bit like myself. <laughs> Cathy, you have done a wonderful, wonderful talk yeah. for us. Um, and you really highlighted how a local community story is central 
um, and just as important to the national story um, that involves the big names. We would have nothing without the ordinary men and women who took part and who played that role and support role, the people we don't know about in Intracore mm. Works. Um, but you have recognised their um, involvement by telling this story. So on behalf of myself and Michal, um, just a huge, huge, huge thank you. Um, and everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. And I'll hand you over now to Michal just to say the final thank you to our sponsors. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks, thanks again to the the, the Minister for Housing, Local Government, and uh, Heritage, uh, Dara O'Brien, uh, and to all in the Custom House, to 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 Tim, to Sean, to to, to Jerry, etc. All of them there. But most especially, I agree with Liz. A uh, thanks to Cathy. Um, we do learn something every time. Um, you know, we started out with one talk thirteen years ago, and we've had God knows how many talks in the meantime, and each and every one of them added to what we've, we've gained from it. Um, you know, we've been able to publish six different books on the subject, uh, more to come, we know that, but everybody is interested now, everybody sees, everybody hears, everybody knows the story, and knows the peripheral stories, so know that it's centered in the history, that it's not the history in itself. Um, so look, all I can say is thanks a million, Cathy, for again, a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, and we'll, we hope to do this again some other time. <laughs> <laughs> so to everybody out there, thanks a million. We're back next week. So, uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.